Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I'm reviewing I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. This is a memoir published in 1969 and it's the first part of her autobiographical series of books which spans seven, seven books of her autobiography. So this very first one is the story of her life that takes us from her early childhood, very early memories, to her teenage years. It's mostly set in a small town in Arkansas. Is that how you say it? In Arkansas? I probably should have looked up how to pronounce weird American states. Anyway, it's mostly set in a small town in Arkansas. The town is called Stamps, which I hope you pronounce like the word Stamps, where she grew up in the 1930s and early 40s. So as far as memoirs go, this only covers a very small section of her life. Though it is also not a very long book. This was a very quick read. The first part of the book, her very early childhood memories, detail her life in Stamps, where she and her brother are raised by their grandmother, who is the local shopkeeper. In fact, I think she's the owner of the general store. So I'm guessing that's like pre-supermarket where people got their things. Um, right from the start, this autobiography does not shy away from the hardships that the author had to go through, such as the constant aggression and racism that she faced from her white neighbors in her community, as well as the personal trauma of being abandoned by her parents at such a young age, and the horrors of being the victim of abuse through her childhood. I don't want to give you a point-by-point -point summary of her life, because if you're after that, if you're after just the facts, you can literally look them up on Wikipedia. But the appeal of this book, the reason why I'm urging you to read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings rather than the Maya Angelou Wikipedia article is in the writing. It's in the prose. I should mention that I'm generally not a fan of biographies or autobiographies or memoirs, but this book is so entirely compelling, start to finish, it took me no time at all to read through this. I couldn't put it down. I don't want to devalue the author's lived experiences by saying this reads like a story because it doesn't. It reads like a very frank and very touching account of what's really quite a difficult childhood. But the way that she writes about it, the prose, the words used to describe these real lived experiences, make it into so much more than just a recollection of the past. This is the sort of book that you read because it's so compelling, so well written that you hang on Maya Angelou's every word and about halfway through you realize that you've just been given a lesson in philosophy and in history and in psychology without even noticing. She sprinkles life lessons all over this book. Um, a lot of the book is, as you'd expect, focused on the theme of youth and of childhood. And a lot of the things she writes about youth and childhood still ring through today, over 50 years after this book was published. I don't have children myself, I don't surround myself with children, and as a result I don't really think about the concept of childhood a lot. Uh, Maya Angelou clearly did when she was writing up this account of her own childhood. And so her writing is just peppered with aphorisms such as Childhood's logic never asks to be proved. All conclusions are absolute. Which makes complete sense if you think about it. The way that uh, children think, the way that children are convinced of their own well, convictions, um, the way that they observe the world and then draw conclusions from it and are just 100% convinced of that. And that's something that uh, you know, she's not writing this as a good thing or a bad thing about childhood, just as a truth about it, something that we grow out of. All of her writing is like this. It's sharp, it's observational. It's the sort of book that makes you want to underline and sticky note every single page. Here's another one, and this one's not about childhood. This one's, you know, about, well, I suppose, about narcissists, even though that word isn't used in this quote. Listen to this. In order to be profoundly dishonest, a person must have one of two qualities. Either he is unscrupulously ambitious or he is unswervingly egocentric. He must believe that for his ends to be served, all things and people can justifiably be shifted about, or that he is the center not only of his own world, but of the worlds which others inhabit. I'm sure we all know someone like that. I mean, that really describes at least 
one person you know. The craft of the poet is all over this book. Her absolute mastery of words are what makes this such an unexpected page turner. Unexpected because the account of a black girl's childhood in 1930s America isn't exactly what you associate with the idea of a absorbing, quick-paced read, but this absolutely is it. The writing is clever, it's thoughtful, but it's also funny, it's heartwarming. Part of that is simply born from the way that this young girl, Maya, sees the world, the way she thinks about it, with all of the naivety, all of the confidence of childhood. There is a warmth to the way that the adult author, Maya, thinks about her former self, and a love that permeates even the dark bits where she's full of guilt and self-doubt, when she's depressed, when she's traumatized, this is written with a lot of love and, you know, it really jumps off the page. At the same time, nothing in the book covers up the hardship that Maya goes through. Nothing in the book glosses over the horrible bits. Nothing uh, tries to downplay the trauma and the violence, the racism, the poverty. All of the things that Maya had to deal with at one point or another are there, they are on the page, they're not hidden away, they are explicit. But they are clearly written with a lot of insight and a lot of thought and the distance of decades. And they are written by an author who didn't just want to write down her life story, but wanted that life story to bring something to others, to the readers. And this is why I would recommend it to anyone, whether you're a fan of memoirs or not, and I say this as someone who's not a fan of memoirs. I really think that pretty much any reader can take something away from this book. Even 50 years after its publication, and even 80 years after the actual setting of the book, there is still so much there that is directly important to us. So this was the seventh of my 12 Decades of Christmas videos. This is a series of books in which I review one book from every decade, starting from the 1900s up to the 1910s. So this book was from the 1960s, which means tomorrow's review is going to be about a book from the 1970s. And you can find the entire playlist for this linked in the description box down below. Thank you for watching. Bye!